I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel. And since it's an hour till Tony time, we thought this would be a great opportunity to take a look back at the season with some of New York's top writers and critics. We've rounded them all up, and they're going to give you a sense of what was good and bad in the season. Best musical? Uh, by a mile, Spring Awakening. Why? Uh, because it uh, celebrates the new and because it celebrates the young. It's about sexuality sexual. and coming of age. And as such, it's also about parents. It's also a fantastic production. And we'll rump him as best musical or I'll give up. Rarely do you get to hear such a fabulous fusion of music and feeling. I mean, here we have these kids, and they're not much older than the kids. They're portraying 14, 15 year olds. And I'm listening to these kids, and every word they're singing is felt. The Bitch of Living. The Bitch of Living, one of the great. You can say that, huh? Great, great theater numbers, really, of all time. Ah, Why did you have to jump up on the chair? Well, you know, that song is talking about everything any young person feels when nobody understands you and you are angry and rebellious. And I told them I wanted them to channel every rock star they'd ever seen. I said, think of Jim Morrison, think of Mick Jagger, you know, think of Jimi Hendrix, everybody who is saying to hell with the world. And um, but they had to be on pitch and they had to hit their marks. That's what it was about. And stomping all the discussion around how much should we stomp until Duncan Sheik said, hey, man, I like the stomping. You know, it was a good moment. What's great about the music is it's so vibrant. I mean, it, it really it reverberates. It carries around the whole theater, especially when you have the neon lights going in the background. You get this sense of it really just being not just hip, but like exciting. There's something very subtle that has a lot to do with its success, which is the lighting design of Kevin Adams. I've never seen anything like it on Broadway, where he's made it seem like you're not seeing a show on Broadway. And that's hugely important for a show well, like Spring Awakening. <laughs> what he's done is make the Eugene O'Neill Theater feel like you're watching a rock show downtown. Why, it's the most disgusting, atrocious thing ever to happen in America. My favorite musical was Grey Gardens. Uh, of course, like so many other people, I adored the 1970s documentary about the Beale sisters and their fall into decrepitude. It's just a fascinating scenario. And the musical was very bold in the way it portrayed uh, Act One as kind of planting the seeds of their demise in a pastiche that was very upbeat. And then Act Two, you see the squalor and the decrepitude that you know from the movie. Soak, moan, blame it on the mother. I think that they found a way to be happy in the world. And I think that what Christine and Mary Louise show us is the way in which they are satisfied and celebrate their lives every night. I think that's the real appeal of the musical. These women reached deep down and they found something quite real. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're beautiful together. You're unmarried, bold and fat. Christine Ebersol gives a performance for the ages in two roles. Mary Louise Wilson matches her all the way in act two as the mother. It's, it's just something you'll never forget. Life is disappointing for the parent through the ringer. Well, Christine Ebersol. It's a double performance of two different women in two different states of mind, and she just nails them both. She sings it. She looks great and beautiful in the first act. She looks absolutely bizarro mania in the second. The integrity is there. I really think that this is an iconic performance that people will talk about, like for years when the old timers tell us about, oh, Lorette Taylor, oh, the Luntz, all that. I think anybody who claims that they love the musical theater and haven't seen, gone to the show to see her do that performance are just frauds and liars. If Grey Gardens and Spring Awakening split the vote, it's possible that Mary Poppins, <laughs> which got some pretty good reviews, and also is. If, if I were the Mary Poppins producers, I'd make sure that all the voters attended that show with their kids. Gavin Lee. Yes. He goes upside down. It's in tremendous. In Mary Poppins, and you love this performance. A song and dance man, he's so easy. There's no sweat, there's no strain. He's got charm, he's got sparkle. And then to cap the whole thing off, he dances upside down across the proscenium of the New Amsterdam Theater. I mean, none of Ziegfeld's girls did that. Marilyn Miller didn't do that. But he does that. And it, it's uh, for me, that was the most magical thing of the entire show. I had a lot of rehearsal because I was quite scared of heights. I've obviously got over that now. I kind of had to. And the upside down doing it at the same time. And also tapping upside down is very hard because tapping is kind of like about gravity, about landing again on the floor. And of course, upside down, you don't land again. So they built me this platform that was much lower to practice on. and. It got better and better, and, and now it's. I'm very lucky that it's one of the highlights of the show, and I'm just the lucky guy that gets to do that trick. 
Favorite musical of the season? Yeah, I'm going to say Curtains. I am not. Throw back to the old-fashioned musical comedy. Curtains, the old-fashioned musical. Why? It's got some great people in it. Yeah. And especially David Hyde Pierce, who was magnificent in this. Yeah. He just glides along, plays it very low-key. He throws away lines beautifully. He's just he's just spot on in what he does. But uh, it's it is a complete ensemble. Anyone who sees it will tell you it is a, it is it's tossed back and forth between all the actors and including the ensemble members. It's one of the ways that uh, Scott Ellis, our director, and Rob Ashford too, our choreographer, had structured the piece is that everyone's a person, every ensemble member has a character, they have specific relationships with all the other characters, and that just keeps the ball in the air for the whole thing. So no, all I do, I walk through the door to make my entrance, and then we just play for yeah. two and a half and hours. Like the best musical you've seen this season? Love music, easily. Why? First of all, there's the wonderful music by Kurt Lyle, which yeah. nothing, nothing that's musical on Broadway today approximates that music. Secondly, wonderful, wonderful three main actors. Oh, three perfect performances there in the three leads. It's about this very strange relationship between Vile and Lala Lenya. And how do, you, how do you define that relationship? What is that relationship about? Well, the interesting thing to me is that two people can in some ways be totally dependent on each other, and in other ways, and this is true of all of our lives, and in other ways be very different and, and, and have a very different sense of morality and uh, a very different sense of what marriage means, entails, or demands. And here you have this, this girl who was practically a prostitute at one point, uh, and this young, this man who was a cantor's good Jewish boy son. So they were really very different. The point is that these two very different people could be united, A, in some kind of basic respect that they did have for each other, and B, in their art, because he right. was the composer whom she needed, it turned right. out. And he and, was the and singer? And she was the interpreter yeah. whom he needed. Yeah. So it was a wonderful symbiosis which shows that people of different natures, different backgrounds can, under the aegis of love and art, find each other and be good for each other. Best play? I gotta tell you that Frost Nixon is a true nail-biter. I never thought journalism could be that thrilling, not since uh, we talked to Deep Throat in the garage. <laughs> I think Frank Langella's performance in Frost Nixon was really one of the revelations of the season. Um, I think there are a lot of people going in expecting that this would be one of these, you know... Like a rich little imitation of yeah, Richard Nixon. Yeah, a, a caricature. Yeah. And he didn't do that at all. He, you know, got some of the basic mannerisms down, but moved on from that into a really richly conceived um, portrait of a man really kind of haunted by, you know, what he'd been through. People I know who are, were absolutely, you know, vile about Nixon have said, well, you know what, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about him in a fresh light after that performance, which I know, I know. is That's quite good. a testament to his performance. Best play? It should not be Coast of Utopia because no one's actually seen all three parts. It's one of the great. I hope you have. You're a secret. critic. You get paid to see all three. Uh, yes, I was. Uh, I was present at all three. I never. <laughs> I, I didn't necessarily see all three, and I saw about two and a quarter, and uh, uh, but the, which is much more than anybody else. <laughs> I wasn't riveted by all of the Coast of Utopia. I mean, it had its longers, you know, it is a seven and a half hour expedition. But in terms of sheer ambition and intellectual ambition and dramatic ambition, uh, it, it has it over almost any, um, really, it has it over all of the other contenders this year. What is it fundamentally about? Um, it's about the ups and downs of history, and it's about the sort of frustrations of idealism. It's about the limitations of dogmatism and the, ne and the, and the necessary uh, slowness of historical change, and um, the, uh, the dangers of trying to make that happen more quickly. And I think that, you know, partly it's understood as, uh, as all one extended prologue to the Russian Revolution, and we know how disastrously that ended. Um, and all of this is kind of explaining the, the, the backs and forths that went into that. Terrific ensemble performance, but Brian O'Byrne stood out. He did. Yeah, I thought he was terrific.
First of all, it's exciting because all three parts started with that image of him rising up from the floor, contemplating the glove of his dead son. Yeah. You, you learn this in the course of a second. And he has this aria about the death of a child. And suddenly, you could just see the entire audience sort of sees and become really emotionally involved. And I found myself so terrifically moved, probably the most moving moment of the entire season. I love Tom Stoppard. I grew up, I mean, I grew up reading Tom Stoppard and Rosencrantz and Gellerstein was like one of the first plays I ever read and said, wow, this is, this is really wild what you can do in the theater. You can do whatever you want. With all respect to Tom Stoppard, that's the most undramatic eight hours I've ever seen at the theater. <laughs> and everybody should stop <laughs> pretending that they've either seen it or it was the most wonderful thing they ever saw. So what are you voting for, for best play? Probably on sentimental grounds, Radio Golf, because August Wilson's contribution uh, to uh, the history of modern American uh, theater is the most fantastic achievement. And so I would uh, raise my hat to that man. They say you fixing to build up around here. That makes sense, seeing as how your family is in real estate business. August was fearless in his conviction about how he felt about the plight of black Americans. And he did that through his plays. He, he, he said that through his plays. He wanted the, all America to know the plight of black Americans. You know, the men and women here that have been here over 300 years of what they had to go through and what they had to endure. And he made no bones about how he put it in words. Um, so he lost a great voice. Um, but at the same time, I'd like to believe that with these 10 plays, we're gonna do these over and over and over and over. So his voice is still here. It's going to be here forever. But no one else has ever written a single cycle of ten full-length plays and accomplished it and w to as much acclaim as he has. And, of course, we don't know what he would have written afterwards. He gave us something which will be with us forever. I mean, people will be looking at this cycle of plays a um, hundred years from now, two hundred years from now, I think for, probably for as long as plays are performed. What makes you think he's a red boy? You are sleeping with him! Little Dog Left. I'm so glad voters remembered this. I, it's so Actually, easy for them to forget something that closed in, what, February? <laughs> and, <laughs> it opened in February and closed in February. <laughs> I think it opened in November. It had be, <laughs> but it played off-Broadway last season. I think yeah. a lot of people remember that and saw it there. And, why and was, why'd you like it? It's just refreshing. I feel like it was a very heavy season. It was great to have a comedy. I laughed my tail off. I just thought it was so smart. It's an American comedy. I mean, how about that? It's about... It's a play that is satirical of life in America, which used to be sort of the bread and butter of the American Broadway play was these smart, fun, sassy, Kaufman and Hart plays that would take a foible in current American life and do a spin on it. And that's all I've ever really been interested in doing as a writer. Technically, when people, the voters are looking back on it, that Julie White's absolutely delightful performance that runs that show, um, I think she may surprise everybody and win the Tony. And I'm, she certainly got my vote. Julie was manically hilarious as a self-loathing lesbian agent who was trying to not only closet her gay client who just fell in love with a hustler, but also trying to closet the script he was going to do to make it a straight romance instead of a gay romance. She represented everything that I detest, but she was absolutely brilliant. Why has the community responded so to your performance? Well, I, I mean, who, who can say? I think that um, I... I had a ball, you know, I had a great time and I didn't judge my character at all. I actually kind of was just went out there and embraced her and played her with a lot of gusto and love. And I think they, in the business they sort of recognized the truism of her and like, yeah, you know, maybe that's just, she's ruthlessly honest. Yeah, we love that. Yeah. And she wore great clothes. I think it's between Julie White and, and um, and, and Vanessa Redgrave, and it's the Janice head. It's comedy or tragedy. Shock the most uh, moving play and performance of the season? I think there's no question about it. It's Vanessa Redgrave in the year of magical thinking. Why? The play, first of all, I think is awfully good. It's, a, it's, an, 
it's a fascinating what it is doing, in my opinion. It's advancing the conversation about death in this society, in this country. Joan Didion approaches this very difficult topic that most of us would still rather turn our backs on or turn, turn away from. We're talking about the death of the most important people in this woman's life, her daughter and her husband. Her entire world collapses. And of course it's Joan's, Joan Didion's way to retain control and to keep it at a distance. But I think. I think, in a way, that's, that's something that Vanessa can do in the living theater, directed by David Hare, quite mm -hmm. beautifully, I think. She makes, it, uh, she makes it reach out and touch you, but not touch you in the sort of a In a sort of cheap, way. sentimental, not tacky way that could have been done by been a lesser done. actress. And might still be. If, I don't think that she'll allow anybody <laughs> else, else to do it. Uh, Charles, not a great play, Deuce, but two iconic figures in the theater, Marion Seldes, Angela Lansbury, a joy to see them perform? Seeing these two wonderful actresses um, performing, you know, Gothamer material, but making it, you know, a full hour and a half of pretty watchable entertainment was absolutely a joy. And Angela Lansbury, as we know, hasn't been on Broadway for, I think, 30 years, 20-something years. So, I mean, how at ease she was, was really kind of moving. It was fun to watch her and Marion, another, you know, legendary theater name who we see, you know, pretty every much season. regularly. Yeah, yeah. And every time we see her, she's even more delightful. Um, she's highly theatrical, and I think that was kind of nice in this show because it was, you know, as I say, not perhaps the best play, but she brought a frisson of theatricality to it that, you know, gave it a real, you know, magnetism that maybe the writing actually didn't have. Not a good revival of Moon for the Misbegotten, but Eve Best is extraordinary. She is extraordinary. I'm probably a little more positive on it than uh, than you are, and than some people are. I actually did find some merit in Kevin Spacey's performance, but Eve Best knocked me out. Why? So much of the attention is given, I feel like, in productions of Moon for the Misbegotten to who's playing Jim Tyrone. Josie, I think, is a much more pivotal role. She's got to hold us for the whole first act. She and her dad are just sitting there, shooting the breeze, talking about Tyrone. I mean, that's really not interesting stuff. But I was riveted. I think she's just, she's entrancing. And I think she's gorgeous in so many ways. Quorum Boy. Uh, it was a wonderful show and uh, a quixotic and noble event on Broadway. Nobody liked it here, did they? They didn't. Pigs that they are. Terrible, terrible. <laughs> what they didn't understand, these ancient critics who are even older than me, <laughs> is that it's for young adults and people who have minds of young adults, who have open minds, not for these boring, jaded old critics, <laughs> all of whom saw it off, but it's for young people. The mistake the producers made it was not in it was in failing to realize that the young people of America are either glued to porn or out shopping, unlike the sedate middle class English youth of England. You see, well, it was a massive hit. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, Coram Boy plugged into all the things the English love: the sense of melodrama, a Dickensian tale, happy Shakespearean endings of mm -hmm. families reunited, and grotesqueness. Uh, there was uh, a grotesque quality. An to undercurrent, it. quite right, of an undercurrent of grotesquery and violence. Yeah. And all of this put off the American critics who didn't know what on earth was going on. You've got a 26 strong choir on Broadway singing the Hallelujah Chorus. What more do you want? Barry Poppins? Yes. Well, there we are. That's the, <laughs> that's the problem right there, isn't it? Howard, um, most moving play you saw this season? I think unquestionably Journey's End. Wow. Here's this play from 1927 that was a very complex play. I mean, a lot of people saw it as an anti-war play. I don't think that's what it is. Because, yes, there is an element of that. War is a terrible thing. But the author was someone who had spent time in the trenches in World War I, and he knew that there are many things going on beyond how awful war is. There's and male bonding, there there's a sense bonding, of community, there's, there's a the sense of being curious, responsible for other people. And a curious kind of grotesque humor. Yeah. It is a very rich play, and I think it's, it could have been easily mishandled. But this British director obviously knew everything that was going on, 
and he took a, I think, almost entirely American cast. And I thought they were all extraordinary. I think um, Boyd a, Gaines, for example. I love Boyd Gaines. Someone we've was, known for years. We've known mainly doing light musicals roles, and musicals, light, stuff, yeah. Yeah. light comedy. Here he showed he has a great deal more. Why do you think that the critics so responded to this work now? To, to, to this, to the play. Well, I, I think it's so timely. I mean, with the. You know, without being strident, without being political, it really says, you know, war for the people who actually engage in it is is really a, a horrifying and, and terrible thing. And obviously, and oddly, the story is told with such humor and uh, and uh, affection for the people in it that I, I think it makes a great case for saying, is really this the way that we should conduct human affairs? Two words for you, Liev Schreiber. Two words for you, great <laughs> actor. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's almost a solo in some ways. I mean, it's Liev Schreiber playing this talk radio host at his sound table downstage and a lot of people coming in and, and making him angry or giving him something to play off. And he's mesmerizing. I love watching Liev. I love watching him make choices. I love watching him uh, crack the play, make it work, make it work in a big Broadway house, come in every night, and give it everything he's got, which is, you know, it's a hard play to crack to begin with for a performer, but then to do it eight times a week and do every show as if it's the last show you'll ever do is, uh, is terrific that he does that. Friends! <laughs> and I can see most of you are my friends from the way you've decked out your beautiful city of Hillsborough. On some levels, the most satisfying experience of the entire season was Inherit the Wind. It's just a well-oiled machine. And you sense that the entire theater was caught up in it. it preaches to the choir, yeah. but these issues are still sadly and unfortunately relevant. Uh, and I really think that people are very satisfied with that production and with those performances. Brian Dennehy in a really solid, good, classy performance. Terrific. Yeah. And the chemistry between him and Christopher Plummer was just great. Chris Plummer in Inherit the Wind? There are things in that performance that I swear, and I wrote this in my review, that I've never seen. I don't know what it Such is as? exactly. That's the, it's, it's some, it's some, it's something you can't quite define, but there's this crazy way in which you feel that he is delivering the performance directly to you in your seat uh, in the dark. Uh, in the way that, you know, they talk about the legendary performances of the past, that the great right. actors could do this. Right. And I think he's doing it. The trademark gesture, I think, is when uh, he wins some little point in one of the courtroom disputes, and then he snaps his suspenders. Yeah. And you can see it coming, and you think maybe he's going to snap his suspenders, and then he does it, and it's still the most hilarious and wonderful thing that you've ever seen. Yeah. And, there, and there's, a way, there's a way in which he, you, he makes you buy into his performance, so that no matter what he does, no matter how small or how big, you're already waiting uh, to see it play out. Yeah. Uh, it's really wonderful. Christopher went that extra distance. He used his wit, his body language, uh, his charisma, and totally convinced everyone that people came from monkeys. <laughs> Bill Nye is the performance that got away at this year's Tonys. I don't know why he eluded them, perhaps because the show shuttered like certainly shutter. sooner than it should have, mm -hmm. and we're talking the vertical hour. Um, and everybody was excited about this by because day, of Julianne Moore. Well, we came to see Julianne Moore, and we fell in love with Bill Nye. And by night, the panoply of the stars, weather permitting. A revival of a musical, you like company. Why? I thought it was very clever what they did. I. I, I I felt the guy walking that, around in a circle carrying well, their no, recorders. I'm just going to say that. I'm just going <laughs> to say that was the one problem. They should have not started walking around in circles. They should have stayed on the perches or went off to the side. Maybe even gone into the audience. But going around and around, you started to get dizzy. But that was the only fault I had. I thought the cast of characters was terrific, and he's terrific. Marilla Spars is terrific, and some of those people are so talented. It is absolutely amazing that somebody can pick the bass up and then the piano and then sing. Great. This is not a show, the way it's done, the way John Doyle works, where anything is a solo. It's a 14-person song. Because you've got to play the piano. And I have to play the piano, which is terrifying. <laughs> but Being Alive is a great case of a song that actually 14 people make with all their energy happen. Uh, the last 20 minutes of the show are good, but uh, it's entirely built on what Barbara Walsh gives me, and the rest of the cast is supported. It's a different way of working on a, on a piece where usually the other people would be in the wings having a cigarette or playing cards. And that final song of his that he has, Being Alive, Being alive yeah. would, for me, when I was in the theater, I was crying for that song. That song, and he was crying too. And there's that wonderful moment at the end of the show where he takes a huge leap of faith, and I think that that's what growing up is all about, where you go, okay, this is it. 
This is it. This is about love. Relationships are a disaster. Everything is really screwed up. Things don't work out. People get divorces. I may not even like everything that there is to like about myself. Love anyway. Live anyway. Choose to be part of this anyway. That's why he's got a great big smile on his face at the end of the show. And it really is his birthday when he says, you know, when they say happy birthday, Bobby. I think he's born for the first time, really. Because you're in this role, you have to live in your emotions so much. I keep living a little bit in my own past as a kid and the things that got me to where I am are the things that feed me every night on stage. And at the end of the show, I go, well, look where you are. Look what you got. My favorite special theatrical event by far, Kiki and Herb. I know these kids from downtown, from the clubs. I was so proud of them. And they really scared the matinee ladies, and that's a good thing. I do monkey jokes. They understand that. Because I'm a monkey. They know that. Silly and satire. Rhesus rhetoric. Monkey, mon stay with me. All right, leave him alone, please. They have this wonderful thing called the Special Atoni Award, which is for unique theatrical events. So wow. I, I dare say that your show qualifies as a unique theatrical Actually, event. Actually, I want to be the best supported actor. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Okay, okay. Very, very good. Very good. All right. The worst musical you've seen this season? The Times They Are Changing. The Pirate Queen. The Pirate Queen. <laughs> Pirate Queen. Pirate Queen. <laughs> the Pirate Queen. <laughs> the Pirate Queen. <laughs>